Hello, welcome to Common Ground, an inside look at Suffolk County. I'm your host, Sheriff Steve Tompkins. Now, in today's show, you've heard the phrase legend, and you're familiar with the word legend. We have a true living legend in the studio today, and that would be Mr. Jimmy Myers. He is a broadcaster extraordinaire. I go way, way, way back with Jimmy many, many years, and we're going to talk about how he got into the broadcasting business. We're going to talk a little politics, we're going to talk a little civics. Uh, if Jimmy is nothing else, he is definitely a student of civics. He is a student of all that's important to you. So I, I, I implore you to listen closely because this man has got some really good things to say. Mr. Myers. Pleasure. Very so nice to have you here. Always good to see you. You know? So talk to me, man. Let's 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 real quickly if we can, and we probably don't have enough time to do that, but let's recap. How did you get into broadcasting? Well, uh, basically it started from the time I was about 12 years old. Mm -hmm. I watched television. I my dad used to watch Walter Cronkite every night. Mm -hmm. And he was just locked into the TV. You couldn't talk to him anything. Once Walter Cronkite was on, that was it. He would race home between his two jobs just to be riveted on this guy. And I'd look at my dad, and I'd look at him, and I'd say to myself, wow, here's my father, a man who had to quit school when he was in eighth grade, but mm -hmm. he admired this man. Mm -hmm. And this man is in this little tiny box called a TV. At that time, it was really small. Mm -hmm. You know, you had to really get real close <laughs> to the TV. Get your head out of the TV. Get your head out of the TV. Get right. your head out of the TV. And I was fascinated by television. <laughs> so I said, this is what I want to do. And I told my dad, I said, dad, since you like this guy so much, what do you like about him? He told me he's a very educated man, he's very smart and so forth. He says, this is what I'd like to, I, I, he said, this is the kind of person that you need to look up to. And so right. I said, okay. I said, but dad, how come there's no people like us on TV? Right. And he says, well, son, we're, we're not at that stage yet. We're not ready. I said, what do you mean we're not ready? I could do that right now. Right. I'm 12 years old, right. I could go in front of that camera and speak. I'm not afraid. Right. So I told my dad, I said, you know, that's what I want to do. Now, my father had ideas of me being a lawyer. My father right. said, son, son. There are no black people doing this. Mm -hmm. So at 12 years old, I sat up, and it might even been earlier, but I remember around 12, because I kept telling him the same thing. I said, well, I'm gonna be the first. And by the blessings of God, I was able to be the first, one of the first in the country to be on major network television mm -hmm. when I started Channel 4. Mm -hmm. In Channel 4 in Boston. In Boston, Right. Yep. Doing mm -hmm. sports. Mm -hmm. Well, first it was BZ Radio. Okay. I went from BZ Radio producing to on the air right. to BZ Television. And the rest is, wow, I mean, okay. it just gets long. Now, you were also one of the first people of color to be on ESPN, if I remember correctly. Yes, I believe I was the second black there. I'm just about positive, because Greg Gumbel told me the night that we did it. Greg Gumbel and I are the first two okay. uh, African Americans to host SportsCenter. Okay. And it wasn't that big then. ESPN, right. maybe right. a million viewers. Today, right. they're global. Right. And it was so funny that I told Greg that night after the show, I said, one day, this place is going to be worldwide. Mm -hmm. And Greg said, why do you think that? I said, well... It may be struggling right now. I said, but Greg, think about this. You have a giant company, Golf, I believe Golf Oil owned mm -hmm, it at the time. Mm -hmm. I said, they're probably going to sell it to a, a major media outlet, which they did to Disney mm -hmm. and ABC. I said, and there's such a thirst for sports. Right. Sports is going yeah. to be like news. I said, we're at the cutting edge of this. We are we are when was blessed this? to when be When was here. this? 1981, I went there. Okay, 81, And ESPN yeah. had started in 79. When okay. it first started, they were like in the parking lot. Okay. I mean, they did all of their shows from the trailer. I'm serious, you're laughing. I mean, you have, you, have you ever, we called it blue lip television. Right. So they had blue lips, because they'd be <laughs> so cold, cold, and they'd go to a break, coats on! <laughs> they put their coats on. It's 10, 9, 8, coats off! They put their coats on. Yeah. <laughs> How you doing? And you had to try to shiver and talk at the same time. So I wasn't there at the time, and I'm watching these guys. Said, these guys, and they're big names: Lee Leonard, George Grand, and all. Greg Gumbel would come yeah. from Chicago, right. and I said to myself, I like to work there. But at the time, I was at Channel Four, mm -hmm. and there were some major, major things going on at Channel Four, which forced me to have to resign on the air. And it became a legendary piece of television. They still talk about it to this day. I quit on the air. You quit on the air? On the air. I made, read my resignation, took my mic off, and just stood on the counter and walked away. Now, a bunch of black people who had no clue, you had no clue of what was going on there. I did. You didn't. They had their opinions. Oh, you get what golden opportunity. All these community people in Boston, right, right. which you didn't know a damn thing about my life. Right. And you didn't know anything about what was going on there. But I did it to make a statement for one reason. I wanted the white power structure at that time to know this is one black person you can't mess with. Mm -hmm. It cost me two years. Mm -hmm. For the next two years, I had to, I was blacklisted across the country. Right. But wound up in New York. 
I walk into WMCA mm -hmm. and do an in-studio audition mm -hmm. without <laughs> without the use of a phone call or anything. Mm -hmm. I made up my own voices. Right. It's all legendary stuff that's in there. Right, right. Got the job and kept it and kept that job. And from there, I wound up going to ESPN. And from okay. ESPN to uh, became the police. I am pretty sure I'm the first full time. African American sports director in the history of New York, if I'm right. Which, and if I'm which, not, which I'm second. Was that? that was Channel Nine. Okay. Uh, Spencer. W -R, I believe yeah, it was, a guy named right. Spencer Christian may have beaten me right. by a right. couple of months, but I know we were the first two because they right. never had full time, full time right. sports director right. in New York. Right. And from there, it's just been a long road um, through radio, through television, through the internet, and so forth. I wanted to ask you about that because when I was in college, I used to do a lot of radio and I actually loved doing radio. Do you prefer one over the other? Do you like radio more? Because, I mean, you're telling stories and people can actually create the images in, the, in, your, in their mind from what you're saying. If they're looking at you, like you say, in that little box on TV, they can see you and that kind of takes away from kind of the, the imagination. Well, the reason I like television is because you can look dead down a barrel of the cannon. That's what we call it, the barrel mm -hmm. of the, right, that camera right there is the barrel of the cannon. Mm -hmm. And I can talk to you with a clear conscience right. and look you dead in your eyes and right. you know I mean business. In radio, you can't see true, that. True, but true. radio is the image of the mind. Radio is right. that beauty. The beauty of radio is when you have more time. You have much more time to say what you want to say and do what you want to do. Okay. Today, there's a lot of internet um, radio that you can see television too at the same time. Mm -hmm. Like you can see people on the air mm -hmm. while they're doing it, which is good, mm -hmm. which is fine. But to me, the beauty to me will always be of radio is the fact that it's your voice and your brain that has to constantly work mm -hmm. on, on a second to second basis mm -hmm. to get things done. Now you have I a, always love radio. You have a rich, very rich textured voice. Your cadence and your tone and your inflection. Did you go to school to learn no. your craft or this God given talent? No, that's God given talent. Okay. You, you can teach. There are a lot of things that you can teach in this world, right. but you can't teach talent. Mm -hmm. See, mm -hmm. that's the one thing that my, my dad and my mom used to always say, God gives each one of us a certain talent. It's what we do with that talent that makes us sink or swim in life. Mm -hmm. I just always told myself, one, if I am well read, if I am truly versed in what I'm thinking and saying, then I will be able to perform and do what I need to do. Mm -hmm. My biggest problem was that I always knew the challenge was going to come from standing up to white people, mm -hmm. people who ran the business, people who wanted you to be a nice Negro mm -hmm. and say what they wanted you to say. That wasn't me, Steve. I couldn't mm -hmm. do it. Mm -hmm. I just said to myself, look, Joe DiMaggio is not the best, best football, uh, baseball, baseball player uh, I've ever seen. Right. I'm sorry, he's not. Right. Willie Mays was a five-tool guy that was a better all-around player than Joe DiMaggio. Right. Joe DiMaggio was great. Right. Great, but he couldn't go get the ball the way Willie Mays could go get it. Mm -hmm. He wasn't defensive center fielder that Willie Mays was. Mm -hmm. He was good, but he wasn't that level. Right. That's my opinion. Right. All of a sudden, that's racism. You, you don't like white people. What do you mean I don't like white people? I mean, right. I, my grandparents are white. <laughs> right. I was raised by white people right. and, and Jewish people and so forth. What do you mean I don't like them? I just see things the way I see them. Mm -hmm. And so by being at ESPN, where we used to have these little one-on-one -on -one conversations in the studio, after about five shows, everybody was going to manager. Can't work with Jimmy. Why? Because we can't beat him. Every time we bring up something, it's auto racing. He knows about that. Mm -hmm. Horse racing. He knows about that. Yachting. Mm -hmm. He knows it. He's black. What does he know about yachting? Because right. I had read it all right. and I'd studied it all right. and I'd, I'd watched the Olympics. It became a part of my DNA of what I wanted to be. I said, I'm not going to be a broadcaster. I'm going to be an exceptional broadcaster. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be a great broadcaster. Now, you can say what you want. It stood the test of time. Mm -hmm. 45 years and counting, mm -hmm. and I'm still here. And I've been blacklisted four mm -hmm. times, mm -hmm. currently still being blacklisted. Mm -hmm. And that's fine. I can live with that because when I'm dead and gone, mm -hmm. they're going to go back and look at all this stuff and say, damn, he was right. Mm -hmm. All that time, he was right. Now, believe me, I do not equate myself in any kind of way with Nelson Mandela or Reuben Hurricane Carter mm -hmm. or men that I grew up with knowing were persecuted their entire lives. It's a different type of persecution for me. It's a mental strain that you have to go through every single day of knowing that you're right, still looking your enemy in the eye and saying, you won't beat me. Mm -hmm. You can kill me, mm -hmm. but you won't beat me. So then talk to me about, and we're going to get off sports for a second then, talk to me about race relations in this country. 
2013, there really does still seem to be this tension amongst the races. When did why it change? I'm saying, but why is that? Why when is did it, it change? I'm not saying that it has changed, but I mean, how do we get past that? We're not going to get past it. We're not going to get past it. We're not going to. No. We're never going to get past it. Not in our lifetime. Not in our lifetime. Okay, go ahead. Our children have a chance, yep. but we don't. We are done. Because we have once again proven, just look at how this current black president is treated. Mm -hmm. And it tells you that there are still too many people mm -hmm. in this country who are white that honestly think that they are better human beings than black people. And how dare this black man try to tell me something that I know. Forget the fact that black man's smarter than you. Forget the fact that black man is the top of his class at Harvard, review, and so forth. Forget the guy comes with all the credentials along with a ton of common sense. You still can't fathom it. Listen, I deal with white people every day in business and so forth, and I'm sitting across the table. I'm the only black person in a boardroom at times, and you think I don't, I don't know? They're waiting. Please say something wrong so I can jump on it. Please say something wrong. And I say to myself, sorry, you're not going to get that today. I'm going to put facts on the table. And you're going to have to deal with the facts. Let's look at the history of our country. Brief. We can do this in less than a minute. Okay. Christopher Columbus discovered America. At least that's what we're told. How could Christopher Columbus discover a country there when he rolled been. up to the shore right. and Native Americans were already here? Right. They were already here. Mm -hmm. How could you discover something then some people were already there? That's mm -hmm. like us going to the moon and finding some people up there and saying, oh, we planted our flag. Mm -hmm. We discovered the moon. No, we didn't. Mm -hmm. Galileo and all these other great scientists, they did it. Okay. So then you come, they offer you a hand of friendship, and you wipe them out. You make 50 treaties with them. This is fact. Don't think this is not fact. This is fact. Go look at your, go read the true history. Every treaty that was made with the, with the Native Americans was broken. So what the hell makes me think that they're, if they're not going to respect these people and they took their land, mm -hmm. how dare they be here when we came and discovered this place? Well, wait, 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 just let me finish. Go ahead. And if they're not going to respect them, why are they going to respect their former slaves? Mm -hmm. So you say our kids may experience may. a different... Right, may. May. So I want to talk about that dynamic. What is it that's going to come about that our kids may have a better relationship across the races, across racial lines? Now, right now? Well, first things first. My parents taught me this when I was very young, Steve. Mm -hmm. The only equalizing barometer in this world... Is education. That's it. You can try to dance around it all you want unless you are well-read, well-thought, well-written, well-spoken. You're not going to make it. Mm -hmm. Because we live in a global society now. No doubt. We're bringing all of these people in, particularly Asian people who have just leaped off the charts. Look, we're going to be smart and, and we'll be quiet. We'll stay over here, but now even more, even Asian people are becoming more outspoken. You live in a world with very intelligent people. You better come up with very intelligent thought. If you're going to put things on the table, they better be, one, well thought out, two, well written, because they have to stand the test of time. Mm -hmm. If we run this interview 100 years from now, I want somebody to say, you know, how could that guy be thinking 100 years down the road? What put him so far ahead of